how important is physician wellness? Studies show that when a physician is happy, healthy, and satisfied, they perform better and make fewer mistakes. They get better customer scores, and they get better at patient outcomes. And if you lack wellness? Then you have burnout, and the opposite happens. You're unhappy, probably fatigued, you dread work, you're not at 100%. Studies show that your error rate actually increases between 5 and 11% when you're burned out. Sounds awful. Well, it can be even worse. Physicians commit suicide at three times the national average. Even female physicians are affected, and their suicide attempts are just as lethal as male physicians. Is it something about our profession? Most of us have four admirable personal traits. We're perfectionists and self-criticized. Even when a patient does well, we hammer ourselves for small imperfections in care. Over time, that takes away from your well-being, and our job is very emotionally draining. Remember, for most people, the biggest stress at work is some inter-office rivalry. With us, it's literally life and death every shift. We are pleasers, and we want to be perfect and always look good to everybody. And it's just not possible. Even when you do a good job, compliments are rare, and any bad outcome is going to be reviewed. We often have to take added responsibility. When was the last time you were sick and actually missed work? The last time you had a difficult patient no one wanted to deal with, who had to take it on? You did. This makes us more vulnerable. These are admirable traits. Without them, you can't be a good doctor, but they do put you at extra risk for burnout. And who gets burnout? At any one time, 20% of physicians have significant burnout. 50 to 60% of physicians experience at least one period of major burnout in their career. With numbers that high, it seems like it could happen to any of us. Well, it can. Emergency medicine is a very satisfying profession. About 76% of emergency physicians are satisfied with their careers. But it's also inherently stressful. Most of us will feel burned out from time to time. If that starts happening to you, realize you're not a bad person, and no, you shouldn't retire. It's somewhat of an occupational hazard. How can you tell when you're just having a bad day versus true burnout? Burnout has three stages. The first is exhaustion, which is a deep sense of physical and or emotional exhaustion, which doesn't improve with rest. You feel worn out before you even go into work and dread every shift. On the emotional level, it's described as a bank account that's empty or in the red with no resources to spend on others. At home, you can be snappy or distant with family. At work, you have difficulty being pleasant and empathetic. You might find yourself ordering more tests because you're too exhausted to think the case through carefully. You might find yourself showing up consistently late to your shifts. Your social graces decline or come across as insincere. Don't we all have days like that? If it's happening all the time, that equals burnout. What happens next? Exhaustion is followed by cynicism and coping by avoidance and withdrawal. You might find yourself ordering more tests to shorten the interaction with patients. You might see everyone with pain as a drug seeker and anyone who displays emotion as hysterical. Some of the worst errors I've seen as a director and state medical board member have at their root burnout. You might also withdraw and compartmentalize your work. You grit your teeth, you do the absolute minimum you have to, never volunteering to help and never going to section meetings. This disengagement might reduce the total hours worked but it makes your work even more alienating. Studies show disengagement increases your chances of quitting emergency medicine prematurely. Sounds like it couldn't get worse, but it does. What's the next stage? Next comes decreased efficacy. You might start questioning the worth of what you do or see it in a very jaded way. Your performance will suffer. With emotional exhaustion, your error rate will go up 5%. With a depersonalization, it may go up by as much as 11%. I understand there are some gender differences when it comes to the third stage. Female physicians tend to doubt themselves harshly and leave or go to part-time work. Men, even when they're ineffective, keep going and tend to blame others for their decreased efficacy. Burned out male physicians become distant, cynical, and oblivious. And female physicians are equally susceptible to males? Yes, they are. Their burnout rate is about the same. Certainly you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you're thinking, gosh, maybe I'm burned out right before you get fired or you quit. Is there a way to test yourself early on or to monitor yourself on an ongoing basis for burnout? The MASLAC burnout inventory is a validated tool that's used in many fields. Medicine is behind most other fields dealing with burnout, by the way. Pick up any Harvard Business Review and about half the articles are about burnout 
or mindfulness. In a market with providers of special skills, such as medicine, the companies that will excel are the ones that manage their talent well. Success as a group is about throughput and quality, but not just. It's also about resilience and sustainability over a long haul. Can you walk us through the Maslach uh, burnout inventory? It's a series of questions with scales in three dimensions. The first is exhaustion, and if you answer it honestly, it can give you a sense of where your emotional and physical bank account is. It includes questions such as, how tired do you feel? Here's an example. I feel like my work is breaking me down. And you answer how often. If you feel like that all the time, you have some burnout. The second dimension is about empathy and interaction. And it gets at how much you care about your patients and coworkers. An example is, I have the impression that my patients make me responsible for their problems. If you feel that way very often, you have some burnout. The last dimension is efficacy, and the questions try to get out how effective you feel you are at work. An example is, I am able to create a relaxed atmosphere with my patients. If your answer is rarely or never, you have some burnout. How do you take the test? It's a test you take yourself, and you have to be brutally honest with yourself for it to be helpful. Remember, all of us experience burnout from time to time. It helps you know where you are right now and can provide an early warning before burnout becomes irreversible and you quit, or worse, get fired. In what dimension will we most often have some level of burnout? Most of us, even when we're doing great, have some element of exhaustion. We're not playing hacky sack here. It's an emotionally draining field. But if your score is fairly high in this dimension, you should do something about it. What about the depersonalization dimension? Well here, if your score is anything more than a few mild positives in this dimension, you have moved pretty far down the burnout road and you should get some urgent intervention. Before we move on to interventions, can you tell us a little bit about the retirement rate and burnout rate in emergency medicine? It's about a half to 1% per year. So that's cumulative over your career in terms of risk. The highest risk is in the second decade. Once you get past 20 years, the risk actually goes down. So for burnout, we have a set of warning signs and a diagnostic toolkit. Let's move to treatment. There are things a company can do, and we'll cover those next year. But for now, let's stick to what you can do for yourself. First, use your higher order coping skills. Second, recharge your emotional batteries. And third, Take good care of yourself. So let's start with coping strategies. Humans have three strategies for adapting to stress. Task-based coping, emotion-based coping, and withdrawal-based coping. For doctors, the best is task-based, where you study a stressor, find out how it works, and take steps to reduce it. For example, as we talked about earlier, how in your second year of residency, headache as a chief complaint stressed you out. So you made a point to see every single patient with headache for three months. And doing that, you learned everything about headaches. And after a couple of months, they became easy and fun, and you even did some presentation. That's task-based coping. In studies of doctors, this is the most effective strategy for reversing burnout and preventing early retirement. The second strategy is emotion-based coping. You don't change the task or make it any easier, but you just work on making it not a bother. It's stoicism, basically, or just keeping a stiff upper lip. This is a good temporary strategy, but in the long run, tends to peter out. The third strategy, withdrawal, is the one that people often go to. That's where you just grit your teeth and do the minimum number of shifts. You don't go to section meetings. You don't keep up on your CNE. You've essentially disengaged from your profession, usually your patients and coworkers as well. This is like a dead man spiral in aviation. You don't realize it, but you're steadily losing altitude, and eventually you're going to crash. It's a bad coping strategy. So while avoidance uh, requires the least effort up front, it's actually the opposite of what you should be doing? That's right. If there is something that's bothering you, engage it. Don't ignore it. The single biggest physician dissatisfier is feeling like you have to compromise quality. When you disengage, you compromise your own quality and effectiveness by default. I've seen this as a medical director. Withdrawn emergency physicians deprive themselves of opportunities for clinical excellence. And believe me, the nurses can tell, and they dread working with a disengaged physician. On the medical board, we estimated that about 90% of the time, the real root of the complaint 
was physician burnout or disengagement. By engagement, do you mean we should all try to be medical directors? <laughs> Not exactly. Engagement has three sides. First, engage your profession. Go to your section meetings, read often, and do your CME. Being up to date is really enjoyable and ups your game. Go to journal clubs or other academic activities when they're available. It's good social time. You might even take on a small project or develop expertise in a certain area. Engagement at work is when you work a shift, say hi to everyone, be social, and engage your colleagues, and engage your patients. When you do a good history and physical, add some small details, like asking them where they're from, what they did before they retired, what their hobbies are, and you'll get a lot of positive energy back from them, and they'll think you're the best doctor ever. Engagement takes a little more energy up front, but it gives you much more back, and it reduces burnout. What about emotion-based coping? It's okay in the short term, and there may be certain patient types that will always drive you crazy no matter what you do. If task-based coping is knowing what things you can change, then emotion-based coping is accepting certain things you know that you just can't change. You know, I still struggle with uh, patients with cirrhosis. It somehow just sometimes just feels very futile. We all have that sort of group of patients sometimes. It doesn't mean you're a bad person or a bad doctor. Just don't let it get to you too much. Excellent. Uh, what's next? Your emotions and your spirit are like bank accounts. When you work hard and have stressful cases or really ugly cases, those accounts are depleted. No one has an infinite energy account. What you have to do is recharge these accounts anytime you can. And I'll just say it again. The avoidance strategy doesn't work. All it does is diminish the rate of loss, and it doesn't help recharge your energy account. How do you recharge your different uh, accounts? Well, recharge your body by getting plenty of rest, eating a good diet, and getting some exercise. Recharge your emotions at work by finding things you especially enjoy. You might really like neurological cases. Learn all about them and do a presentation for your group. At home, recharge your emotions by spending time with your loved ones. Find some work-life balance. Social activities like meetups or going to service or doing community service can be very recharging. To spiritually recharge, just stop and think about what an amazing job you have and what an important mission it entails. It's hard to see when you're in the think of thick of things, but you save lives and help people every day. Helping other people recharges you. Think of when you really enjoyed taking care of a patient. You probably engaged with that patient and had an emotional connection. If you can do that with all your patients, your day will go quicker and you'll be a lot less worn out and you might even be more energized. Are there any studies on this? There are good studies out of the Mayo Clinic, which has a structured physician wellness program. They've shown that simple interventions, such as bi-weekly meetings to discuss shared experiences, Mindfulness and small group learning drastically reduced the burnout scores, improved physician empowerment scores, and engagement scores. And it was simple, just getting together and talking. Well, thank you very much. That's an excellent review, Dr. Crocker. Thanks. Glad to help. In today's module, we learned about burnout and wellness. We learned that there are three stages of burnout, exhaustion, cynicism, and decreased efficacy. We learned that a certain amount of exhaustion is an occupational hazard and relatively common. We learned how to self-assess for burnout with a Maslow burnout inventory. You will experience burnout from time to time. This does not make you a bad person or a bad doctor. The key is to assess yourself early and often and to intervene before you become ineffective and unhappy. We learned that there are three adaptive strategies for stress, the task-oriented, the emotion-oriented, and the avoidance-oriented. Of these, the task-oriented is the best and avoidance is the worst. We learned that avoidance and disengagement may be tempting, but ineffective and ultimately poisonous to your work and your soul. The emotion-based strategy of being stoic has value, but is not very effective long term. Lastly, we, turned, we learned to think of your personal resources, physical, emotional, and spiritual, as bank accounts, which need to be recharged. Recharging them can be done in many ways, but not with avoidance, which simply show, slows the rate of depletion, but does nothing to recharge. Tying all these together is engagement. Engagement will make your day go better, will make your patients happier, and ultimately will recharge all your bank accounts. Look for more details in upcoming modules, and also look at Dr. Crocker's PowerPoint presentation that's available on the website. 
We hope you enjoyed this video and we hope that it will help you to approach wellness and burnout fearlessly but with appropriate respect. Mm -hmm.